and recording. All right. Yeah, we were recording. So um, welcome, everybody. Uh, we have a good amount of attendees. Uh, hell, this is the fourth of the fall 2022 Sarah Little Turnbull Visiting Designer Speaker Series, where we've talk to various luminaries in the world of art, science, activism. And today we're talking to a designer um, and futurist. Uh, this semester, we're focusing on cross-cultural design. So that means we're looking at how UX designers should best, and all designers should best respond to users from different cultures. How do artists and designers respond to different ontologies, which are different worldviews or bodies of knowledge, et cetera. What happens when those cultures mix? and how do we best harness the dialogue between cultures as they mix? And uh, lastly, how does this mixture of culture reverberate down through history and give us the essentially the world we live in today? Uh, and just as an aside, the series is running concurrently with uh, Abhya Yala, Structural Origins, the show, it's an exhibition in the Lehman College Art Gallery, mm -hmm. which is uh, this semester is participating in the New York Latin American Art Triennial. This exhibition opened on the 21st of September and it'll be gone by the 28th of January. Um, this le lecture series, by the way, is also a component of a design course run by Professor Sean Chang, who is here tonight in the, in the virtual seats along with his students. So they're all here uh, to, to listen and to hopefully ask questions. We have a Q and A uh, button at the very bottom of your screen. If you have a question for our guest or for us together, you feel free to ask. Uh, this lecture series is also open to the public, so if you are the public, feel free to ask a question or two. Our guest today is uh, Manohuya Barcham, the strategic designer and futurist and current president and chair of the National Board of Directors of IAGA, the Professional Association for Design. Manohuya has helped uh, clients such as the Australian Federal Government, Transparency International, and URS Corporation be it's become, help them become more innovative, struck strategic, sustainable through a blend of strategic analysis and the optimization of operational performance. He's going to explain what all this means, I hope, with a focus on complex change initiatives, new product and service design and deployment, and digital an to analog transformations. He complements these more technical skills with a deep expertise in systemic human-centered capacity building within organizations. Um, Menowia challenges and energizes teams to enable them to engage in big picture thinking uh, through multimodal design work, uh, natural connector. Menowia spans cultural, ethnic, religious, and national boundaries to bring fresh perspectives to how design and Design insights can be used to bring organizations, technology, and people together to create new value. And this is a, in his own words, very lovely statement. What binds all of my work together, both written and practical, is my desire to help design and craft spaces of engagement and in doing so, expand the scope of creativity and creativity in order to create a more vibrant, more sustainable, and more just world. Menahuya, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Um, yeah. yeah. So that that first intro, that so that's my LinkedIn. That's my professional. Yeah, very hey, professional. I, yeah, I need to get work. Thank you very much. So this is what I can do <laughs> for your company. Maybe um, I'll talk a little <laughs> bit less about this today. I think today yeah. is an opportunity to talk more about maybe some of the other stuff that I'm doing with community. Yep. But the sure. same general idea and yeah. approach to design sort of underpins this. And of anyway, course, just yeah. To link back to the um, the AIGA thing. Yeah, so AIGA is um, the organization of professional designers here in the US. Yeah. Um, we've got about twelve thousand members across the state. We just had uh, the states. Uh, we just had our uh, national conference here in Seattle. I'm based on the West Coast, uh, which was great. We had yeah. I think about twelve hundred attendees. Wow. Um, from students through to um, senior designers out in the field. Um, yeah, uh, so we were like 114 years old, I think. So we're like the oldest design yeah. organization, I think, in the world, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and for those of you who haven't heard about us, it's AIGA.com. Um, yeah. uh, it's a space where uh, st there's student memberships as well. Um, so maybe a great place to learn more and connect with both other student designers uh but maybe also with with others i mean um as an immigrant to this country i moved here as an adult aiga is how i first started building out my community of designers here 
um, mm -hmm. as a as a new designer in this country. So, and, and I suppose I am um, what's the word biased being the president now. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's a great organization. I, I think yeah. um, the networking opportunities, the uh, the ability to meet um others wanting to change the world in the sort of same ways i think we'll be talking about today has yeah. just been um really important to me and i think can create a lot of value for 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 all sorts of people but particularly for students it's a yeah a lot of our biggest like names like you know um like michael Beirut, beirut and like yeah um graphic design all started with aiga they were students yeah. he's a former president and stuff like that debbie millman so yeah like all these like, big names um all sort of started with aiga so it's it's still there it's still going strong yeah. um and if you're interested you can always send me a note if you'd like to learn more or i can put yeah. you in touch with people but um yeah it's it's, it's a, i think it's an important organization both in terms of working with designers to meet others um but yeah. also maybe at a national level um in terms of broader discussions about how design can play an important part moving forward as a country yeah um, and this I suppose gets down to some of the stuff i'll be talking about a little bit today it was like how can we redesign some of the systems yeah. um you know very apparent ones like our health system our education system which definitely need work yeah um, but but even broader in terms of that and this is some of the stuff i guess i'll talk to a bit which is things yeah. like colonizing these systems as well yeah this is great well we're really we're very honored to have you so thank you for 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 coming um so why don't you show us what you're working on and what your oh, okay. um sure. what your mission is yeah no, that sounds great hey so i've just put together like a bit of a slide deck should take like 20 25 minutes to get through and then we can get into yeah, a conversation. Chat. Yeah, yeah yeah um and so uh, my practice um, is really around interaction design. So some of that is digital, uh, but yeah. some of that is about um, how people interact in spaces. Um, so, you know, what they now call service design or strategic design, yeah. stuff like that. Um, but, and and so, I'll just make sure I'm, this is working. Uh, and so like my design practice very much is, so I still teach occasionally. Research is an important part of what mm. I do, but, but practice. Uh, and so I like to think that my um, my design practice is informed by theory and research, um, and that I'm able to take what I've learned in the world as a practice practicing designer out in terms of the into the classroom to help students understand how they can bring about the type of change that often they, they want to do. It is possible. Sometimes you got to think a little bit to the side, but it is it is possible. Hey, but in terms of um, talking more about my practice we should probably talk a little bit about like who i am and where i'm from because i think it's an important part about how i ended up doing what i do okay so you can tell from the accent i'm not from here originally so yeah i'm from new zealand which is why the name with lots and lots of vowels so my mother is what they what we call maori which is our word for ourselves which are the indigenous peoples of new zealand and my dad's family they came from england maybe 100 years ago okay so just a mix of the two and so i grew up on the equivalent of what here in the US they would call a like a reservation. So not super remote. Um, we had a couple of towns of about 50,000 people, maybe eight, nine miles away uh, from where I grew up. And so I was bused into uh, school. Uh, but um, again, like reservations here, so no town, no, no shop or anything like that. We didn't have a flush toilet. I'm a bit older than all of you guys, but well, we didn't have a flush toilet until let me think, would have been the late 80s. So it wasn't that long ago, hey? So pretty primitive in terms of spaces. And remember, New Zealand's a pretty rich country. And so this is, again, a similar things that we have here in the US. We have pretty extreme wealth, but pretty extreme property as well. So I, I grew up, so here's just a picture of, so for us, we have these carved meeting houses. And um, so I grew up in a community of quite small. It's like 14 houses, uh, 14 families. And we were a member of a clan um and this is our sort of our clan meeting house so tane nuyarangi is the name of the house and kuhupatski is the name of our uh, village or reservation i suppose and so i grew up there was like a, a field across from this and then my mom and dad's house is through here and so we don't these are more used ceremonially but as a community where we would all sort of 
come here to make community decisions and stuff. So, um, and actually represents, you can sort of see the head at the top and the and the, 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 the triangles going down is like the arm. So it actually represents an, an ancestor for us. And actually it's not, this is part of the issue of ontology and worlds. It doesn't represent an ancestor, it is an ancestor. So again, a, a slight difference in terms of how we perceive this is a, a living being for us. Okay. So who are Maori? Just as a quick thing. Uh, so if on the picture on the left, you've um, got Thor, and next to him is his director, a guy called Taika Waititi, uh, who is also Maori from New Zealand. He's actually uh, from a tribe just north of where I grew up. Um, and he's you know, amazing. From, He's yeah, amazing. he is pretty good. He is pretty good. So he's directed Thor. He just wrecked, he's one of the co-directors and co-producers of Reservation Dogs on Hulu, which is mm -hmm. which is a great little series as well if you're interested in that type of thing. And yeah. the other one, which is older, but if you haven't seen, there's a pretty powerful movie called Once Were Warriors, which talks about the impact of urbanization as a result of colonization on us as a as a people, and what that meant for those of us. Again, I grew up in a very sort of traditional space. Um, but many of our people moved to the cities because that's where jobs were. Um, it's it's a really great film. It, it's available out there nowadays. It's very powerful though, so it's not a happy film in many respects. But but yeah. I think it speaks to the urban experience of a lot of both indigenous people but people of color in general uh, in terms of trying to adapt to the uh, modern urban environment. Anyway, so that's just sort of situating where I'm. And, and that's important for my design practice in the sense that I grew up with two sets of grandparents who spoke different languages in the household, which might speak to some of your experiences growing up. Um, and since, well, since as long as I can remember, I've always been translating. I translate from one set of grandparents to the other, backwards and forwards, shops, and those types of things. But also, um, I realized later conceptually um, because I do something which was I, which I knew was polite in one household and I do the same thing in the other household and I get told off or, or smacked and so I said, oh okay so that's bad so then I do what I thought was the good thing in the other whole household and get told off or smacked and I don't know how I dealt with the cognitive dissonance like many you know young kids growing up in this sort of cross-cultural space I, I figured it out eventually but I think it's relatively common in the world. It's like these, these different worlds that we have to inhabit. Anyway, I realize now that a lot of my work as designer is about translating worlds and creating spaces for different worlds to speak to one another. And I realize that I've just literally just been doing this my whole life. Uh, I was just lucky enough to fall into a space where finally I get paid to do it, as opposed to just being told by mom that go and translate for your grandparents. Anyway, that, that might speak to people's experiences. Um, and so a lot of my work, and again, Dave talked about like the more professional stuff that I'll do for companies and stuff, is designing interfaces for experience and meaning, which many of us do. Okay. Um, but what I've always actually been really interested in today, I'll talk more about some of the stuff that I prefer to work in uh, rather than I do to earn a salary, which is great. I need that too. Don't get me wrong. It's an important part of being a practicing designer. Um, I've always been interested where these systems break down, which is often where worlds overlap. Um, and, and, and again, these are sort of the spaces where I've always been most interested in thinking, well, because often these spaces are designed, but when you bring them together, they're not designed well in terms of the overlap. So I've always mentioned what happens when this breaks down. And as part of that, I've just been really lucky. So this is just like, um, like some random photos I found on my laptop of like different places that I've just done design work. Um, most of my work has been either here in North America, mainly West Coast or the Central region, up in Canada as well, or around Asia Pacific. So Southeast Asia, out in the Pacific Islands. And so these are just shots of places like Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Canada, uh, Palau, um, just all sorts of Kiribati. Some, some are like micro islands, some are huge, like Indonesia has got like 220 million people or something. Um, so again, just really different parts of it. So again, I've just been really lucky in my career being able to work as a designer in lots of different spaces. Um, I think we're at this real in, inversion point globally 
And this is something Dave and I were just talking about actually just before we started today is we got these new emergent technologies, AR, VR. Um, we got these new social orders. So I don't know if you saw, there was a massive election down in uh, Brazil um, on Sunday, um, really close between a extreme right and a sort of not not necessarily moderate, but not not extreme left. Um, yeah. You know, we're seeing similar things here. I mean, we've got an election next Tuesday here in the US, huh? Yeah. So lots lots of shifts and changes there, and the climate crisis. I was just saying here in Seattle, we're known for being really like moderate, but we were 87 degrees uh, just over two weeks ago, which is 20 degrees hotter than LA. We should never be 20 degrees hotter than LA. And apparently, I was just looking at the weather forecast. We're going to have snow next week. So, again, the, the climate is just changing radically. Mm -hmm. And some of it is because of the negative impacts of design. And so there's a guy, yeah. Victor Papanek, who's a really famous industrial designer, wrote a book in the uh, early 70s, 1973, um, which basically said that to his thinking as a product or industrial designer, designers were or design was one of the most dangerous disciplines in the world what he was talking about was the way in which i suppose in his career or his era uh designers were building things out of single-use plastics and how these types of things were contaminating the environment but now if you think if you're a designer working for say facebook you know your design impacts one seventh of humanity like that's a large number yeah. And as we've seen in terms of how Facebook has been used as a tool by many groups for good and bad, including things like coordinating genocide in Myanmar uh, with the Rohingya, um, with some of the stuff that's been going on in the Middle East, what's been happening down also in South America, um, even here uh, with QAnon and a lot of that type of stuff, just the power that these digital technologies can have. Um, more for bad than good, actually. Yeah. Um, and so then this opens up this, this, these sort of questions like, well, what does this mean? What could this mean? What can we do? And I think there are things that we can do, um, but it's understanding that we're all embedded within these systems, okay? And these systems can feel overwhelming, that we're just one cog in a, in, in a, in a greater whole. Uh, but even that one call can make a difference. And this, as I, I, I suppose I'd argue, is like where you as design students or students interested in design are actually able for your own practice to bring about changes. Because again, you might just impact one family, one individual, one community. But if lots of different people are doing that, it aggregates up. So you can make these types of changes. And I'd like to think that over the course of my career, I'm helping to bring about some of that systemic change. Um, I also just just, just to, to interject. I mean, I totally agree. That's the thing that keeps me going in the morning. Is like I'm one person. No one person can change the world, but the world changes constantly. It always has and it always will. And someone's, everyone is driving that change, right? Yeah. So you can either you know be a positive direction and be in like flow with the salmon going in, the, in that direction, or you can do, you could do something horrible and, and be a horrible person and, and add negativity to the world. I mean, it's, it, and, and as a designer, we have that superpower where we can not only choose to do that, but we can see a vision and we can work together towards the path. I mean, it sounds so, it sounds so flowery when I say it, but honestly, that's what we do. That's what designers do. That's all, that's our job right on paper so i just i totally agree and i yeah no it's it's true and again because our choice uh, well yeah as designers a part of what we do really in our practice is we make choices yeah do that's all it is yeah. yeah but but an important thing is to my thinking at least is to choose not to do something is also a choice and so yeah, absolutely the very famous famous saying by a guy um desmond tutu who was a mm -hmm. anglican or episcopal Episcopalian bishop in South Africa yeah. um, passed away recently, but during apartheid times and said, you know, in a space of oppression to choose not to do something is to side with the oppressor. So we always have Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and, and again, it's realizing that we do have that agency. It might seem like not much, but it, it, right. it added up over time. It, it can be. Yeah, can aggregated. Be. Yeah, totally. Aggregated. Totally, yep. totally. 
Um, and again, this is part of the space that as designers we inhabit is yeah. um, we can create these spaces of interaction. Yeah. And again, beyond just the digital, this when I say to people that I work in interaction design, I mean it in a more expansive way, literally right. interactions, which could be digital to digital, could be person to digital, could be person to person. These are all yep. interactions. Hey? Yeah, but again, these are the spaces that we can work. And again, on this sort of slide, and I'll, I'll share these with Dave afterwards, um, is this new understanding of this materiality of that with which we design. Hey, it, you know, back in the day, if you're an industrial designer, it might be like ceramics and stuff mm -hmm. like that. If you're a traditionally in Com D or graphic design, you know, it was about graphites and different typographic fonts and stuff like that, which is still important. But there are all these other materialities that we can use, which could be digital bits and bytes, but it could be spaces to create better interaction within people, which can be things that can sound really boring, like policy and procedure manuals or yeah. HR spaces. But those are actually the tools that you can create like a positive organizational culture in a school. You know, yeah. that's the materiality of reforming our education system. You know, mm -hmm. and again, these things are all available to us as designers now, which for me, as someone sort of definitely mid-career, um, makes it such an exciting time to be a designer. And, and I think part of that is this movement. This is sort of that, the third dot point, I suppose, here is it's moving away from just the designing of things but designing of spaces of interaction. How do these things interact together? What are the relationships between these things. And I think this has been a really, uh, really important and expansive space for us as designers around the world to realize that the things are all bound together by relationships and we can design relationships as well. Yep. It's been really, really powerful, yeah. I, I, I think. Um, and so in, in, in terms of that is we've got these, what I call systems of systems. Um, so for example, like a school operates within an education system, but an education system here, the U.S. education system with, works within this thing called the U.S., which works within this capitalist system. So again, it's like these systems of systems of systems. Yeah. Now, that can seem overwhelming. The yeah. important thing to take away from that, though, is if because the systems are all interconnected, if we can create a change in one part of one system, then that change could change in parts of the other systems, which could cause change in other parts of the systems because they're all interconnected. So in that space, this concept of this interconnectivity of these relationships is very powerful for us as designers because with a few small directed spaces of intervention, we can actually bring about these cascades of great change. You know, and again, yeah. this is this notion of aggregating up change. If we're all sort of working together in different ways, that's yeah. how we're going to change systems to create more equitable systems, right. uh, for okay. example. And then part of that is this realization that we exist in what I call like a plurality of worlds. I talked to, I referred to a little bit like for me growing up with my grandparents, two sets of grandparents, very different ways of being in the world. One very Anglo, one very sort of Polynesian, Pacific Islander, really different ways of seeing what's of value in the world. One family, very individualistic, yeah. one much more about the, the family overall. Again, not to say one is better than worse than the other. They're just different. Yeah. And But trying to think, how can we get the best of all these worlds? You know, rather yeah. than, which has often been the case, people saying, well, this is the one. You know, and that that just leads to all sorts of all sorts of issues. So how can we take this idea of there being a plurality of worlds? Anyway, so it just just as an interesting side. So when worlds collide, so what is this a picture of? Okay, so it's a picture of hair in someone's food. Now, most of you probably revolted. This looks disgusting. This looks really bad. And I agree. This is also really disgusting for me. But my hunch is I am disgusted for a different reason than you are. My hunch is you are disgusted because you are thinking, oh, that hair is contaminating the food. That's my general sense of most of you. Dave's not even said so. That's where Dave's at. Yeah, okay. For me, I also feel a sense of intense revulsion because that food is contaminating someone's hair. 
So for my people, for Maori, for Pacific Islanders, the head is the most sacred part of our body. This is all pre-colonial, pre-Christian. And this, this is all the mana is based here. And so um, uh, food is something which, which is common, nor we in our language, whereas the head is tapu or sacred. In our language. And so to have food do something like that is to literally disrupt the sacredness of that person. Like this is literally one of the worst things. Some of our some of our worst swear words in our language refer to this type of thing. So again, we both, uh, all of us, I imagine, are disgusted by this, but my disgust is the complete opposite of yours. So again, just interesting how these different worlds that we inhabit come together sometimes in agreement, but for the complete opposite reason. So, so, so again, just interesting in terms of how these different worlds um, come together. Um, and so I, a lot of my work at a higher level, even with its client based, you know, uh, is doing these two things. One is about decolonizing design. You know, how, how can we decolonize design, which I mean, overcome this colonial opposition to difference, which was basically why, for example, we had like the Carlisle School over in the East Coast, which is taking young Native American men and women to take the Indian out of them, to turn them into good citizens, by which they mean good Anglo-Americans, okay? And so how can we, through design, decolonize these systems that continue to do these same types of things? And I'll talk about our education system um, a little bit later. And this is a global thing, and it's still happening, okay? So, for example, if we see what the uh, Chinese state is doing with the Uyghurs, in Northeast China or have done in uh, Tibet. These are the same systems that the English did for hundreds of years, that the Spanish did for hundreds of years. These are the same systems of dispossession, of taking one system of being in the world or one type of knowledge and saying, this is how things should be. Everything that is different uh, at the very best is just lesser than, at the worst is just wrong. Okay, And thinking, no, these are all legitimate ways of being in the world? How can we bring these spaces together without causing one to overcome the other, but rather to exist well together? Um, and this is in this issue of decolonial design, which is a related but similar topic um, of how can we take these different worlds together and bring them together in a sense of positive engagement? Okay? Um, anyway, so a lot of my work is around these two key things. How can we decolonize through design and how can we pursue this process of the decolonial? I just thought I'd then jump into some examples of some of the work that I've done over the last sort of few years-ish. Uh, this one's a little bit further back, I realize, because this is me pre-beard. Uh, so this is me in a place called the Federated States of Micronesia. Uh, again, this is me doing some field work. We were designing some work uh, community engagement processes for a local nonprofit um, in a place called the Federated States of Micronesia, which used to be a U.S. colony. It's interesting when you go um, to to FSM, they say Federated States of Micronesia. It's interesting because you have both the Department of the Interior, you know, which is an internal, you know, the internal management of the U.S., but you also have the Department of State, so you have an embassy there as well. Like they're they're on the same street, uh, so it's a strange thing of being inside the U.S and simultaneously outside the US. So again, how these systems come together. Um, uh, some work that I did recently with some colleagues up in Montana, um, that again, about reducing diabetes in the community. And then part of this was, um, you know, in design, we really need to go where the users are. So we were at a powwow up on, uh, you can see Rocky Boy, which is a Cree um, Ojibwe um, reservation in uh, Northern Montana. Uh, I mean, we could work with the doctors and come up with some great ways to reduce diabetes in the community. But if we're really going to find out what's going to work or not work in the community, again, we need to go to community. Where do we go? So we go to the powwow. We sort of hang out at the powwow. So this is me taking some shots. Uh, they were just getting ready with the drum circle uh, beforehand and stuff like that. So again, this notion of we need to go where the community is to work with community. Um, and, a, and a more extreme version, this is some work I did for the United Nations a few years ago up in the highlands of Papua New Guinea um, around developing small businesses. 
Um, um, that was that was really neat. Um, hard to get to. Um, I was I was actually still based in New Zealand at that point. Um, and so it was like a one hour flight to the main city in New Zealand, then a three hour flight to Sydney in Australia. And there was a three hour flight to Northern Australia, then a three hour flight to Port Moresby, which is the capital, then a one hour flight to a place called Mount Hagen. Then it was like a minibus for three or four hours. You know, the minibus with the chickens and the pigs, it was great. And then once we got there, it was a two hour hike in to the villages where we were working. So it was great work, really enjoyed it. Um, but again, these different worlds. So I, I met one of my colleagues' dads uh, up there and um, he was quite elderly at this point, um, but he remembered first contact. He remembered the first time, he was like four, I think, would have been in the early 1940s. He remembered seeing a European for the first time. He remembered touching metal for the first time. He remembered seeing a plane, all these crazy, crazy things. Um, and I, I met his son when he was doing his master's degree down in Australia. Uh, so again, these crazy ways in which these worlds um, come come together in terms of in terms of um, producing or designing. That's the key thing: designing good outcome. Um, this is some of the work that I've been doing here recently. So um, this is uh, <clears throat> in a, a elementary school in a, a reservation, maybe an hour north of Seattle. Here, uh, Tulalip is the name of the reservation. Uh, cool Cedar Tulalip is the name of the elementary school because here in the U.S. Um, our school systems have been designed historically to, well, to create workers, really, to be blunt, um, but a very specific way, which included focus on mathematics and reading and certain, certain, certain skills were prioritized over others. And we've had systems of um, evaluation, which have favored those whose home culture matches the school culture. Okay. And so we had the system set up up until about oof, uh, eight years ago called No Child Gets Left Behind. And basically, we'd, we'd have these um, testing across the US. And if schools or kids did badly, they were labeled as failing. They were put into improvement. Okay, And so there was actually some positive here. It's about data. That was useful, I think. But the way in which that data was used to classify kids and schools as failing um, was really problematic. And it led to all sorts of really strange issues where, for example, it might be young African American males were driving test scores, scores down. So what the school would do, because it'd be related to money, is they'd get all the young African American males in the school and they'd go on uh, um, uh, a field trip somewhere so that when the tests were taken, they wouldn't push the school's scores down, like really appalling stuff like that. So in the last years of the Obama administration, they switched things around. And this has been very powerful for us as designers. And so what they said is, hey, it's actually about systems. And if we look at schools and we see that they're getting low test scores across different population groups, for example, that doesn't mean that the kids are bad students or just bad kids, which is often what people used to talk about and think about things. Rather, it's just saying that, hey, the system of education that we're using in that school probably doesn't match the learning needs of that community of those kids. Okay. And that's what this data is telling us. Not that the kids are failing. It's that the, it's not that the kids are failing. It's rather that the system is failing the kids. And so what we need to do as an education system is we need to provide resources to help the people in the building understand what are the specific learning needs of this community which might be more kinesthetic, might be more about human human interaction. It might be more visual markers and there are lots of different ways. And if we can do that, more than likely what will happen, if we can match the education system in that school, match the needs of the kids of this community, we'll see the test scores go up. And sure enough, that's what we see. Wow. So I have a quick question about yeah. that. How does that all jive with the common core? which is some, it's, it has a somewhat parallel story to No Child Left Behind, but the common core, which is a sort of like the law of the land in terms of educational standards across the country, is also geared towards creating workers, right? It's geared towards STEM and geared away, it's geared away from arts education and, and arts and humanities, et cetera. 
And um, it also doesn't consider it was never when it was designed, it was designed by a, a, a coalition of like state governors it had nothing to do with educators. Right. So uh, or if it did, it had to do with like professional, like private educational companies that are, you know, trying to make a dollar. But um, the Common Core doesn't seem to be considering its users. Right. It's um, it's user based. So but it is the law. It is a system enshrined in, in law. So how how does this um, something like this, which is a microcosm, how could you grow this into something national to sort of work against the iniquities of the Common Core? Well, I know and it's I a big question. No, no, no. It's, yeah. it's, it is a big question, but again, that's part of it. Is yeah. the concept of a Common Core itself isn't necessarily bad. It's this notion of what are the things that we think are important for our kids to succeed mm. in this society, mm. mm-hmm. but I think when we don't allow space for shaping that to match the specific ways in which our communities engage or learn, that's when it becomes problematic. Okay. So again, it's this balance, Hey, of bringing together, it's a great example of bringing together of these worlds, like a, a separate looking a bit differently from curricula. Like if you go not so much here in this school I'm talking about, but a lot of our schools in Eastern Washington, we have large migrant populations, many Hispanic, okay, uh, working, um, and that they'll be migratory. Um, and there was this myth really prevalent of the schools is the Hispanic parents aren't interested in their kids. Why? Because they don't turn up at the meetings. When you actually you know go a little bit deeper, you realize, well, it's because the meetings are held at like three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Their parents are working. But if you hold the meetings like seven or eight at night, you actually get a huge amount of people because they're intensely interested in the success of their work, of their kids. But they need to put food on people's plates. So again, it's matching what the system of the school is to the needs of the community they're serving. And again, so back to the, so that's a great example of that. But in terms of the common core, it's a way of thinking, this is um, some base building blocks but how we might deploy that in different schools can be really different. And again, I think that's an ongoing theme, not even theme, ongoing issue, I suppose, we have to gauge with in the US is centralization is really useful because it makes it easier in some ways. But too much centralization means we lose the difference that is our country because we're so vast. We have so many people. We're so different. And yeah. so it's how do we bring these two things back to this idea of mixing words. How do we bring these ideas into conversation in a way that's constructive, that takes this concept of a common core, but yeah. then contextualizes it in a specific place for that community. Interesting. And, and again, okay. this, this is a space where design is very powerful yeah. in terms of how we can contextualize these things. Yeah. 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 Um, Oh, sorry, I just didn't realize this is comes out. I didn't, it's a really low res image. So apologies about that. No, that's this. okay. Yeah. So anyway, so you've seen this before. This is Tane Nuerangs. This is where I grew up. So one of the things important for us is um, we're a plains people, uh, but the rivers are really important. Uh, the rivers were spaces where traditionally our, our women would give birth. Uh, this is where we would fish. All these, there's lots of, lots of material around. Them. Now, unfortunately, colonization, brought farmers we had farms before but not the expansive types of farms that the english colonists brought um which modified the environment and so what used to be a space of you know uh richness for us as a clan in terms of gathering shellfish and fish etc was because of pollution caused of runoff from farms and all that time caused the river to turn into this which is really, really bad. And actually, Dave was reading something I wrote recently about what we've done about that and the design processes that we use to co-design a a rejuvenation of um, our river, both working with settler communities because they have interests that they they want to uh, continue with in terms of uh, leisure use of the river, but also maintaining their farms and stuff like that, um, and using the mechanisms that they're used to, like pH level of water and all that type of stuff. But also, given what we think is important about the river, about things like Modi, 
which is our concept for us of life essence. Like how do we how do we bring these things into conversation? And you, again, you can see this is just like a standard picture I took right at the beginning of the project. And you can see literally, if you can see the cursor, dead fish lying on the top of the water. Great for the seagull, not so good for the humans. <laughs> um, and and again for the for the river, which for us is a living breathe, a living being. Um, really sad like um like my my elders my, my grandmother's generation would literally cry for the river of what had happened what had happened to the river um anyway i, I won't go too much we maybe dave and i can talk about this but um through this process of bringing together different stakeholder groups literally walking the river but trying to bring these different mechanisms of measurement too like things like scientific measurements like ph but also using things that we would talk about traditionally like modi life essence of the river we literally we 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 the new word for the river we literally called it the dying river that was our new word that we because it was it'd been dying for years but we were able to sort of reactivate things and again create lots of value i think for lots of communities but particularly for ours and, and this is a great example of that is um one of the things that colonization has led to for our community but many others is the breakdown of a transmission of knowledge like i was really lucky i grew up bilingual a lot of kids don't you know because it was seen as being well historically they used to get beaten uh, my mom's generation for speaking language um but also because it wasn't seen by even native parents as being useful you all should learn english you can't help but learn english if you grow up in new zealand it's like growing up in the states you you all we're all going to learn english but to be bilingual is actually a really great skill it's a great thing apparently for our minds and like literally how our brains grow uh but also to be able to switch and use different languages is really useful i i speak a few other languages now and i think that's helped anyway what we were able to do with this is create these spaces where we could get the schools to bring the kids down to see the elders talking about the various uses of the river and this was really a powerful for example because for the first time this is for well, for many of the kids this is the first time they'd seen like scientists really interested in what their grandparents were saying it's like wow I just thought my grand my granddad used to like moan about all these types of things. It's like, wow, these like scientists are really interested in what granddad is saying. It's like, oh, maybe the stuff they're trying to teach me about these old myths and stuff is important to know. Um, and so it's done some really neat stuff just in terms of our families and our clan, in terms of restarting that transmission of not just Western knowledge, you know, how to read and write and math and all that type of stuff, but our old stories, our ways of being in the world. And so for me, that's been really, really exciting. Because again, I, I would argue that my success in the world was because I grew up in two worlds. Because my grandparents and my parents thought that it was an advantage to work in two worlds, to be able to, to be fluent, to be able to work in these two worlds, whereas many weren't. And so this is a great example for some of those other families to say, no, these are good things um and so this is what the river looks like now like don't get me wrong there's still issues we're still working on them but it's a much better space now you know over the space of about a decade we've been working on this um as a, as a clan and then like the final thing i want to end on is something that was written by a maori politician uh to my mother actually so this is quite a famous thing in new zealand just off the you know just by the by um and when he wrote it it was interesting he was he was elderly when he wrote it but when he entered parliament, so he, here he is a native man entering parliament in, I think, 1893. When he entered, he had a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a law degree. Interestingly enough, he was actually the most qualified member of parliament, like being the most qualified member of Congress, and he happened to be Marvin. So again, wonderful things for our young ones to hear. Um, and so the, the first one is in our language, which I won't bother. <laughs> <laughs> but the see the important part for you all is the English. And again, this notion of grow tender shoot for the days of you will. So again, he's writing to my mom 1949. So she would have been seven then. Um, to so turn your hand to the tools of the Westerner for the well-being of your body, but turn your heart to the treasures of your ancestors as like a diadem for your crown, you know, something to wear like a uh, uh, on your um, on your on your head and, and give your soul into the creator, the author of all things. So it's just a wonderful way to bring together in language 
in the original Māori, which I think is, is very poetic, I think it translates well in English too, um, to understand the positives of bringing these worlds together, even though the colonial experience has been really nasty and lots of really, really bad things. There are still good things in Western culture. And so how then can we bring these things together? How can we bring these worlds together? And to be honest, I think a lot of my, if not all of my work is still really to do with this, which was something that someone started talking about with my mom. Um, yeah. Gee, when would that be? 70 something years ago. Yeah, yeah. So again, just part of an ongoing conversation. It's um, it's it's beautiful. Can you, um, there's a question, really a, a request in the Q&A to, I think it is important to hear this in your in your native language. Could you recite it? Oh, sure, you can sure. hear like the cadence yeah, yeah, of it. Yeah, I yeah, feel yeah, like yeah, that's, yeah. yeah get, get a little, <laughs> get a sip. Or some water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Something, yeah, yeah. Sure, no, totally. So in our language, so it's called etipu area, which means like a uh, little shoot grow up almost. So etipu area, mungara oto ao. Ko to ringa ringa ki ngā rākau a te pākeha, hei oranga mō tō tinana. Ko tō ngākau ki ngā tāonga o tīpona, hei tiki tiki mō tō mahunga. Ko tō wairua ki tō ātua, nā nā nei ngā mea katoa. So that's how it sounds like it's in our language. I mean, it's it's um, beautiful. And, and for those who are interested, so it's a Polynesian language, so our most yeah. uh, similar would be like Hawaiian or yeah. American Samoa. So I can't understand them. Um, maybe a way to think about it is, you know, for Spanish speakers, they can sort of read Portuguese. It's yep. the same for me, not so much about Hawaiian, but like Tahitian. Um, yeah. If a Tahitian and I speak slowly, we can sort of understand each other. Interesting. Um, so sort of like Porto Novo. Uh, you, can, it, you can sort of get by. There's, a, there's another comment here, and it kind of goes into something else I want to talk about, which is that it sounds like a river. Right, because of the um, it's because of the vowel structure, you know, the way the vowels sort of are in a rhythmic structure with the consonants. Yeah, um, it, it's it has like a like a rhythmic sort of water like flow. And oh, I, I was, suppose, yeah, yeah, we we yeah. do like vowels in our language. You're like my yeah. first name. Manuhia. We we just love the vowels. Yeah, it's the opposite of Hebrew, which has in its yeah yeah form, totally zero yeah, yeah. vowels. No vowels. No, the yeah, vowels yeah. you have to like you have to like know you have to go to school to learn where the vowels go, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you maybe say it once at your bat mitzvah and you're done. Um, but um, I think it's something interesting. Like you, um, you had you had reference an article in 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 your writing, uh, and I'll just bring it up really quick. I think I have it here. Yeah, and so I, I stop the share. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think this will stop it, though. Um, I was just wondering if you could discuss, um, yes, this article: New Zealand River granted same legal rights as a human being. Oh, sure, sure, sure. And and I just, um, I mean, it sounds so. Um, you know, last week we spoke to an artist. She deals with water, uh, indigenous relationships to water, and water rituals that's yeah. her work as an artist and it, it kind of got me thinking about our relationship to water in the u.s just westerners or the modern let's say modernist or colonial capitalist however you want to phrase it yeah. maybe it's all a big grab bag of all that stuff uh, water is just a uh, commodity right it's not like even going back to like the the romans right which is like one of the very first of the world's empires yeah water was something that um could be uh, manipulated and carried over long distances for usage in homes as a commodity. Yeah. It is not, you know, in Western, going all the way back to those cultures, water is not a living thing. It is, it doesn't have any spiritual qualities. Um, but if you look at in many Western religions, Christianity, Judaism, uh, water does have, you know, some holy properties yeah. and you know it's, it's it's like a it has a metaphorical spiritual thing that goes deeper and way farther back than than empire but um and colonialism but it's such a different relationship i was hoping you could just talk to us a little bit about that yeah. about how do you reconcile those two things yeah yeah um well and again so what they've done in new zealand and other places have done this as well 
is to grant geographic features like rivers or mountains. So there's some really neat stuff underway in South America at the the moment uh, around granting, recognizing the status as beings with rights. Now, it's actually not perfect because they're, um, they're, they're treating them almost like corporate structures. I don't mean corporate by company, but in Western law, we have this concept where we can have these non-human things can have rights. So the, yeah. the most powerful of those in the US is companies. Companies mm-hmm. have rights to do things. That's exactly and, what I was thinking of. Yeah. And so we've done that. We've used the same <laughs> vehicle, but for geographic features. So that's yeah. an important initial move to realize, to have systems, to create a mechanism so that systems can recognize that these things are important in and of themselves, not just because of their use value for humans, i.e. Yeah. as irrigation water, as drinking, as a place that yeah. we fish from. So it's a start, but it's still not where we are at, where you, the body of water is an ancestor, it literally is your ancestor. Um, and, and so I think like that news story that you showed where the the river was granted legal rights in New Zealand as an entity is a great start. Right. It's moving things, but it's still a long way away from our yeah. worldview. It's trying to use yeah. the tools of the Western The tools that, exi- that are existing, yeah. Existing to map yeah. across. But again, it's not bad. It's just not perfect, uh, but it's good <clears throat> enough. What we yeah. need to do, though, is just to keep moving on and again i i I open up the q a and i see sean ask a question about yeah yeah about design can be used to achieve grassroots change in the face of resistance to change i I think a lot of that actually then goes back to some some basic stuff for us as designers is when we're working with community we can be strategic about what we do and how we engage and i think often you know because for various reasons um, certain, you know, historically disadvantaged or underserved communities just don't want to work with outsiders because they yeah. have really bad experiences of that. And sure. so the one of the ways to start doing that, to initiate, is to, and again, I think there's something we can always, not always, but we can often do in our design work, is to really listen to what they're saying and to almost, if you can, as quick as you can, take something from that and do something with it, create a product, create a process so that those people that you're working with have in the back of the mind, oh, Manuhuya came, listened to what he said, and he actually did something with Mm, it, which has created value for us. So I can trust him a little bit more than I could when he first turned up because he actually follows through with what he said he was going to do. He didn't, yeah. as often they do, they come and they consult and then they just do what they're going to do. Yeah. And again, you have to be strategic about it. If you can do this about something that actually creates a shift, a positive shift in a community, then people can see the value in contributing. It's like, oh, not only did he listen and do something in line with what we said would help, Yeah. we can actually see the positive impacts on that community. Oh. Maybe we will go to that next community meeting. Yeah, that's a really great. Um, that's a that's a really great piece of advice, actually. That I think designers overlook. Like we're designers. Like I work in an art department, so I work a lot of artists and designers. And I've I know I we share DNA, right? All yeah. all of us where we're happiest where we're in our studio in a, or in a room behind a desk with the lights down, working alone, right? Yeah. And 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 it's great. Like we love it. Um, and we, when we occasionally walk out of the room or, or turn on the lights to live in the real world, you know, we feel a little out of place. But I really do think that working, listening to other people, collaborating, it's the only way out of that designer rut where we're like working top down and pushing yeah. deliverables out the door. It's like the worst way to actually make substantive, meaningful things. Yeah. Um, I, no, they're very, very much so. But, yeah. and, but it, part of it is we have to be willing to sit in that space of uncomfortableness. Yeah. Um, though I think it's similar that you maybe have the same with your students as I do when I teach is for young designers is helping them 
feel better at sitting in that space of unknowing because yeah. young designers very often want to jump to a solution. Whereas yep. sometimes yep. to and to do that is to shut down. Remember, I said for me, design yes. is about choices, is to yeah. shut down all this other whole universe of choices around you. And so sometimes, <laughs> even though your sketch looks really good as a solution to the design issue at hand, it's not the only solution. Maybe it's yeah. good to why don't you do another five or six yeah. more sketches and let's talk about it then. So the same type of thing of the unknowingness of that uncomfortableness. There's yeah. growth in there for us as designers, but it's yep. a mechanism to back to Sean's question uh, to help them help people understand what we're doing could create value. Because if people can understand that you really are interested in what they're saying and what they have to teach you, yeah. and that there is going to be something of value created from that for them, once you've got those two things, a lot will open up and flow. Yeah. I, I feel like what you just are talking about too is what I've sort of identified as being a partially a corrective for what's happened in the last two or three years with the pandemic. I wanted to ask quickly because you spoke about the pandemic early on in the beginning when you're talking about the IAGA and what you guys are doing and how you're trying to work around the pandemic and it's getting better, but it's a work in progress, right? And then we were kind of, we're talking about, um, you were working classrooms and school districts yeah. and listening and be, you know, meeting these people where they are, right. And yeah. working up from there, which I think is very well taken. And I, and, and, and good advice and a good mechanism for doing this. You're also a futurist, right? So my concern that it had me up a couple of nights this summer was that there are, um, children like my son, who's five years old, right? Who he just started kindergarten. He's doing great. But um, there's a whole generation now of COVID children, right? Who, yeah. who are like out of school for two years and it has reverberated through the different ages th in different ways and disturbed their development in lots of different ways. Yeah. Here I am at the college level, my colleagues and I are teaching people who, um, you know, they're 18 to 80, right? They, they range, yeah. but in the next 15 to 20 years, we're going to start to see the, this and be getting the students who suffered educationally through COVID and yeah. they've lost a lot potentially, maybe. Um, and I feel like uh, we have to prepare ourselves for that. Uh, we have to rethink how we educate them. And I actually, my belief is that the best way to do it is to engage them in exactly the same way that you're saying is that you create this sort of, sort of unsure space for them right where there are no s solid answers and they have to achieve them how do yeah. you feel like does that sound right to you i mean as if as a, if you're strategically planning for the next 20 years of the results of covid yeah. how, what's the best what do we do like we're, we're oh, i like, agree i agree no no okay we need to we need to change our system to match our kids yeah it's, it's as simple as that because again for us to say and I don't mean it's a needle, but it's to say, oh, no, the system is failing the kids. Mm -hmm. The insight for me from that is, oh, our system is not matched to the needs of our kids. So what are the yeah. needs of our kids and how do I restructure the system to match them? If we do that, if we resource that. Yeah. Because, again, if we look back historically, this isn't the first time. You know, we've had no. that, like 19, no. the, what they call the Spanish flu. Spanish flu, yeah. It's happened before, but we... But we need, again, it's about choices. We need to realize and it, that the system doesn't match the needs of our kids because of this global pandemic. So yeah. what we need to do, I, I, for me, it's pretty obvious. We just need to change the system. Yeah. But people have to realize it. And we can do it. But again, it's, it's breaking that down into the smaller spaces and giving people the agency to do that. Because yeah. often teachers don't feel they have the agency. So again, it's I, yeah. breaking them down into these smaller spaces to create doable chunks of work. Because it's easy enough for us to say, hey, just change the system. It's like, oh, my yeah. God, what do you mean change the system? <laughs> But if it's uh, it say, like, hey, as an individual teacher in the classroom, here's some basic testing that we've put together. Yeah. Um, well, and and again, we could you could do this as a design project. And it's like if they if they rate here, we'll do this, and then some modules about how you might want to shift things in terms of your classroom, in terms of more one and one. Maybe we're going to focus more on reading 
initially because that's what we're finding is because i do a bunch of work in the education space is our younger kids have really struggled with um reading literacy yeah older kids have struggled with math uh, yep. particularly those yep, that's who are right. like um, freshmen because that's right, yeah. when they were switching into higher order math like the algebra and stuff they weren't in the classroom and so yeah it's the two spaces so again we can already see patterns the younger ones yeah. need to work yep. on literacy the older ones need to work on numeracy and so from there we can break it down break it down break it down um yeah and again the, the notion of breaking it down into doable chunks that people feel they can do and providing spaces where we as designers who can support around things like process and artifacts work with people like teachers and families and communities who know, who have their knowledge. And again, this is where the co-design becomes really important. Yeah. How can we take our different knowledges? And this is where as designers, I think we can be really useful. Take those different, because we have processes to bring those knowledges together because that's what's going to provide us a a, a true space of understanding about what needs to be done. Yeah. Wow. I think I need you to come to my next school board meeting and <laughs> just go off for another, like 10 minutes on a tangent. No, no, I so mean, it's, I feel, no, it's totally doable. It's totally, yeah. but, but we need to, we need to honor that really. Yeah. I think you know, there's a comment. Take... There's a comment here of we need to read it on the system and honor teachers as creative leaders and experts. And I think that's key. Yeah, totally. These teachers, these teachers, by the way, have, master's degrees in education yeah. you know in this country they are they are masters of what they do and more importantly from your perspective they know the students they they have a lived experience that board school boards and administrations do not have yeah. and i think they're the best prepared to do it i i totally agree with you unfortunately we're out of time this has been incredible i w- we could have we could probably have two or three more of these talks but um, hopefully we can have you back someday in the future. Uh, Manuia, thank you so much for meeting with us. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you spending your, this time with me uh, talking. And uh, was there anything else you wanted to mention? or? Um, I, or I don't think so. Look, again, I really appreciate getting the opportunity to talk. That's I mean, my dog. No, this That's... is... <laughs> hey. um, hi, I mean... hi, Winnie. Yeah. <laughs> This is, yes. this is stuff I love to talk about. This is, yeah. this is why I do what I do. So it's just a real pleasure to talk with you, to talk with, uh, to talk with the others. Um, yeah, yeah. The only thing is, uh, like, my name is literally unique. There is no one else in the world with my name. So do feel free to reach out if people want to connect. They want to learn more about AIJ or anything else. Yeah. I am relatively easy to find, literally, yeah. because my name is unique, which is strange, I think. There is no one else in the history of humanity who has ever had my name. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. Thank you, Benoia. Uh We uh, we will certainly reach out with questions, I'm sure. Everybody, thank you for coming. Um, and remember to meet with us next week. Uh, we're going to be continuing on the fifth uh, iteration, the fifth episode of this semester. <laughs> thank you, everybody. And uh, please have a good night. And for Menowia, have a good afternoon, I guess. Thanks. It's Appreciate that. Four Take o'clock care, over there. All right. Bye. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye-bye.